APGO Basic Science Topic Dysmenorrhea and Endometriosis Dysmenorrhea is pain associated with menstruation. It is the most commonly reported menstrual disorder, with more than half of menstruating women experiencing some pain each month. The objectives of this video are Understand the histology of normal endometrium and myometrium To understand the pathophysiology behind dysmenorrhea and endometriosis and to understand the pharmacological treatment of dysmenorrhea. To review the clinical management of dysmenorrhea and endometriosis, please view the APCO clinical educational videos, topic number 46 and 38. Let's meet our patient. Disha Manorrhea is a 19-year-old female who presents to your clinic for dysmenorrhea. Menarche was at age 12, and menstruation has been painful for as long as she remembers. She has regular monthly cycles that last five days. Pain begins on day one, gradually decreases, and is gone by day three. She asks you, why are my periods so painful? To answer her question, let's take a closer look at the uterus and endometrium. The uterus is a muscular and glandular organ. The myometrium is a highly vascular muscular layer, composed of bundles of smooth muscle and interwoven layers responsible for uterine contractions. It surrounds the endometrium, the inner glandular layer. The endometrium is composed of simple columnar epithelium with simple tubular glands. As we zoom out, it has two layers, the stratum functionale and the stratum basale, also known as the stratum functionalis and basalis. The stratum functionale is a luminal layer and contains the tubular glands surrounded by endometrial stroma, as well as the distal portions of the spiral arteries and its arterioles. The stratum functionale is hormonally responsive and proliferates and degenerates with the menstrual cycle is the temporary layer of the endometrium that is lost during menses. The stratum basal is deep to the stratum functionale and contains the basal portion of the endometrial glands and the proximal portion of the spiral arteries. Unlike the stratum functionale, the stratum basal is retained during menses and does not change with the menstrual cycle. Now that we've reviewed the tissues, let's answer our patient's question, what is going on to cause the pain? Primary dysmenorrhea is painful menstruation without a clinically identifiable etiology, while secondary dysmenorrhea is painful menstruation caused by an identifiable underlying condition such as endometriosis. Primary dysmenorrhea is mediated by prostaglandins. Let's discuss prostaglandins in more detail. Prostaglandins contribute to painful menses in two ways. Prostaglandins result in contractions and ischemia as well as overall increased pain sensitivity by increasing the resting membrane potential of pain neurons, resulting in painful menses. Prostaglandins E2 and F2 alpha are produced by the endometrium in response to progesterone levels, which increase during the menstrual cycle and peak at the mid-luteal phase. Most of the prostaglandins present during the endometrial slough are created at that moment secondary to a short half-life. The prostaglandins are liberated by cell wall breakdown from the shedding endometrium. Prostaglandins mediate smooth muscle contraction and act on the myometrium to cause contractions which lead to high intrauterine pressures. The increased intrauterine pressure exceeds arterial pressure. The arteries serving the uterine tissues are compressed and cause uterine ischemia. In ischemia, anaerobic metabolites accumulate and stimulate type C pain neurons. Other causes of dysmenorrhea are mediated by stretch receptors and other mechanisms. Let's pause, read, and apply. When does pain with primary dysmenorrhea typically occur with each menstrual cycle? Pain typically begins right before menstruation as the level of prostaglandins are high with endometrial sloughing. As menstruation continues and the endometrium is shed, prostaglandins and pain levels decrease. The onset of primary dysmenorrhea in a woman's life often coincides with the onset of menarche, consistent with our patient's history. Conversely, secondary dysmenorrhea is painful menstruation caused by an identifiable underlying condition of the reproductive system. Pain onset may be later in life with the onset of the underlying condition. Also, pain is often not as directly associated in timing with menses as in primary dysmenorrhea. Pain may begin a few days before menses, may worsen as menses continues, and may not cease after it ends. Common causes of secondary dysmenorrhea include endometriosis, adenomyosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and uterine fibroids. Let's go back to our patient. Disha has heard of endometriosis before and wants to know more about it. She asks you, what is endometriosis? 
You discussed with her that endometriosis is the presence of endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. Common areas for these endometrial deposits include the ovaries, fallopian tubes, cul-de-sac, broad ligaments, uterosacral ligaments, and peritoneum. Deposits can be superficial or deeply infiltrating and are responsive to hormonal stimulation like normal endometrial tissue. These extrauterine lesions trigger inflammation, leading to dysmenorrhea. The etiology of endometriosis is thought to be multifactorial, and there are multiple hypotheses about its pathophysiology, including the retrograde menstruation theory, aberrant lymphatic or vascular spread of endometrial tissue, and the coelomic metaplasia theory. In retrograde menstruation, endometrial debris travels backwards through the fallopian tube during menses into the peritoneal cavity. Tissue implants on various structures. Women with outflow tract anomalies have been shown to have high incidence of endometriosis, which supports this theory. However, most women have retrograde menstruation, but only a few have endometriosis. Other factors must play a role. Endometrial tissue may also spread through the lymphatic and vascular systems. For instance, endometriosis has been found in pelvic lymph nodes of women with endometriosis. In addition, endometriosis can be found in unusual and distant locations, like the lungs. One way to remember the coelomic metaplasia theory is to remember that coelom means body cavity. This theory suggests that cells in the peritoneum are pluripotent and can undergo transformation to tissue identical to endometrium. This may explain endometriomas of the ovary, since both the ovary and malarian ducts, which give rise to the endometrium, are derived from the same epithelium. This also helps explain how some girls have endometriosis prior to menarche. Our patient wonders, could I have endometriosis? How would we know? You explained how endometriosis is often suspected clinically based on history and physical exam, and treated empirically. However, the gold standard of diagnosis is laparoscopy. In these laparoscopic images, the top image is a typical lesion, while the bottom is an endometrioma where there is endometriosis within an ovary. Endometriomas are also called chocolate cysts since their contents can have a brown tar-like appearance. Inflammatory cells break down the red blood cells in the tissue deposits, resulting in pigmented lesions as shown here. Lesions may be red, white, or black, also known as powder burn lesions. And the older the lesion is, the more likely it is to be pigmented. Lesions can be biopsied and sent to pathology. Zooming in, this is a typical endometriotic lesion with endometrial glands and blood in a background of endometrial stroma. Imaging and biomarkers can also be used to aid diagnosis. Transvaginal ultrasonography can detect endometriomas if they are present and helps exclude other potential causes of pelvic pain. With ultrasonography, endometriomas can range in appearance from a hemorrhagic functional cyst to similar to malignancy. On the left is a hemorrhagic cyst. These cysts have a reticular pattern with a fishnet or lacy appearance. On the right is a classic appearance of an endometrioma with a diffuse ground glass appearance. CA-125 can be a biomarker, but is not often clinically used. In general, levels correlate with disease severity, though CA-125 has poor sensitivity to detect mild disease. As dysmenorrhea is mediated by prostaglandins released from endometrial tissue, First-line treatment is targeted at decreasing prostaglandins, as well as by reducing endometrial tissue. For our patient, you recommend taking a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, such as ibuprofen. In addition, you recommend hormonal suppression, such as with an oral contraceptive pill, which will help decrease pain and serve as birth control if needed. Let's pause, read, and apply. Why are NSAIDs commonly used in the treatment of dysmenorrhea? NSAIDs inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 in the cascade leading to prostaglandin production. COX-1 and COX-2 are involved in the production of prostaglandins from arachidonic acid. Inhibiting COX-1 and COX-2 with NSAIDs thus decrease prostaglandin formation. Hormonal suppression, another first line for dysmenorrhea, also decreases prostaglandin production at the level of arachidonic acid. Hormonal suppression, such as with oral contraceptive pills, inhibits gonadotropin release, which suppresses hormonal stimulation and proliferation of the endometrium, resulting in endometrial atrophy. A thin endometrium contains relatively small amounts of arachidonic acid, decreasing the amount of prostaglandins. This concludes the AFCO Basic Science video on dysmenorrhea. We have discussed the histology of normal endometrium and myometrium. 
the pathophysiology behind dysmenorrhea and endometriosis, and the pharmacological treatment of dysmenorrhea. Thank you.